Well, welcome, and thank you for joining us. The name of this program is Straight Talk, a public affairs conversation sponsored by the Midland Cultural Center in North Simcoe. My name is Doug Mon, and I'm the moderator of Straight Talk. First and foremost, I want to acknowledge and thank our season sponsor, Brampton Brick, for their generous support of this program and all MCC community programming. Our topic today is anger, the distemper of our times. Now, there's no question that for the last two years, many Canadians have been left feeling anxious and unsettled. Every family has been touched by the pandemic in some way and what it left in its wake. Serious health concerns, controversy about uh, vaccine mandates, and economic and social disruptions. So Canadians, understandably, are feeling on edge generally these days. But as we live our daily lives, many of us are witnessing more sudden and extreme outbursts and displays of anger on our roads, airplanes, even in grocery stores. Just add the word rage to just about every type of normal, everyday activity, and that's what it can be. And it's shocking to see. Hair trigger outrage in public, in Canada, of all places. The public officials we've observed are increasingly subject to insults and abuse, which sometimes have escalated into real threats. We saw that in the last election. Political differences often become angry confrontations. And toxic social media platforms can sometimes feed this frenzy. So I'm asking our panel some questions today. And to begin, has an essential shift occurred in how Canadians feel they have the right to treat one another? Are we losing our collective civility? Indeed, we had that sense. And what seems to be happening to the spirit of tolerance in this country that we used to be so proud of? A straight talk has assembled a panel to ask just these questions. And I'm going to be asking them, are these incidents of extreme anger just an aftermath of the pandemic stresses? Or has there been a shift in our behavior as a society? And broadly speaking, are we no longer a civil society in Canada? I'm delighted to introduce our panel today. I thank them for being here. Our first uh, panelist I'd like to introduce is Dr. Flavin Ishmael. Laban. Dr. Ishmael is the medical director at Waypoint Center for Mental Health Care in Katatanguishing. He joined Waypoint in 2014 with a degree in psychiatry from the University of Toronto. Dr. Ishmael leads a multidisciplinary team in the evaluation of mental illness and behavioral problems for adults with neurodevelopment delays. At uh, Waypoint, his duties also include overseeing clinical inpatient treatment and monitoring the appropriateness of their medical care. I understand Plavin also is very experienced in running anger management support groups in our community. So welcome, Dr. Ishmael, and thank you for attending today. Welcome, and I'm glad to be here. And I'm going to call you Plavin from now on, as you told me to. That's right. Our next guest is certainly no stranger to our audience in Simcoe, Bruce Stanton. Hello, Bruce. After a successful career as a lo local owner operator in the tourism business, Bruce was elected uh, as the MP for the riding of Simcoe North in 2006. And he served as MP until 2021, just last year. And during his time in the House, he was the deputy speaker. As well, he was the chair and a member of a number of important standing House committees, including Aboriginal Affairs and Northern Development. Now, Bruce has a well-deserved reputation both at home and in Ottawa as a straight shooter and a fair-minded politician. And we're so glad that you could join us, Bruce. Delighted to be here with you all, Doug. Thank you. And our last uh, panelist is Professor Scott Sheeman. Hey, Scott. Professor Sheeman is a tenured professor of sociology at the University of Toronto, and he's also the Canada Research Chair in the Social Context of Health, and I'm hoping, Scott, you'll explain that to me before we're done today. Uh, Scott is the author of many publications uh, in his research main interest, which is mental health in relation to work in everyday life and how it shapes our sense of self, identity, and well-being. Now, Scott, your focus on the impact of work on our lives merits another discussion altogether sometime. 
And as a recently retired person, I would certainly have a few questions for you, but that will be another day. So welcome, and thank you for being here, Scott. Uh, pleasure to be here. So, gentlemen, I'm going to ask our panel uh, to give their take on the issue as I framed it. Uh, what uh, do they think is underlying these over-the-top emotions we're seeing out there, or have I exaggerated in how I framed it? So if I could begin with you, uh, Plavin, Dr. Ishmael, if you would. Absolutely. Uh, thank you uh, for the question. Um, <clears throat> anger is an emotion. Um, and uh, just like any emotion, it has like both positive and negative aspects. Uh, just like if you think of love, that it can be uh, quite uh, constructive as well as uh, destructive. I think it's what's important is to differentiate between anger and rage. Mm -hmm. To me, anger is an emotion that is an aspect of uh, neurochemicals in your brain. Um, if you look at uh, how anger has been classified in history, you would uh, see that, you know, uh, with Darwin, they talked about how anger is um, um, just a way of us adopting to danger. And then you get into psychiatry and you have the Freudian explanation where they think of uh, anger as more of a hydraulic thing where you have a reservoir and if it overflows, then you uh, react. Uh, so it's important to make that distinction, right? Is that, are we talking about anger in general or are we talking about rage, as you had put it? And finally, it's also important to understand that are we, has anger always been there and now we are seeing a shift in it being translated into rage? Um, certainly, uh, I'm seeing a lot of that. Uh, in my practice, I'm seeing a lot of that. Uh, personally, in my family, I'm seeing a lot of that uh, social media. Uh, on television and where have you, right? And it comes down to uh, this one thing, which is I think people are feeling more vulnerable today than ever before. And when you talk with them about their anger, I can often um, narrow it down uh, to either a sense of injustice or a sense of vulnerability. Now, people were always uh, somewhat vulnerable in the past, but uh, never to this level, right? Uh, you look at what's happening with the political unrest. You look at uh, the inflation. You look at the housing market, the stock market, uh, the effect of the pandemic. Um, we have always been a little bit vulnerable, but uh, we never quite did realize it until we got hit by this pandemic. And uh, as a society, we are uh, reacting to our vulnerability. Uh, again, this pandemic has brought forth uh, social injustices that were perhaps not uh, that clear to all of us. And again, we are seeing our uh, reaction to that. Uh, I mean, we can get into the nitty gritty of like the biochemistry of anger, but to me, it always feels that there is always a social and political context to anger, um, as opposed to just having an angry episode that is pure, purely biological. Obviously, people have um, um, biological issues, uh, such as in mental illnesses, and then there is manifestation, and, uh, and some people are diagnosed with those mental illnesses, but you're also diagnosed with life, right? And then you are responding to the vulnerabilities there. So that's my take on uh, the situation. Okay, well, thank you, Clayton. We'll get back to that uh, for sure. All right, uh, Bruce, uh, I've got a lot of sort of questions about the political context and the sense of what you saw during your 15 years and then today, but well, what's your, your sense of what's going on? Well, I think um, as Dr. Ishmael uh, rightly pointed out, there is a, there's a whole range of things that can incite anger in people. I mean, we are in a society now where there is a the hordes of information that one can tap into. There is uh, all kinds of uh, content in our lives, uh, particularly now on social media platforms, which we know Canadians are using extensively to get the things that inform their day. And so there is a, there is a wide range of things that can uh, tap a nerve or get people unsettled. 
Um, when they do, I mean, one, I think one of the shifts that has occurred here, even in the time that I was involved as a, as an elected official, um, is the degree to which um, they, the, the, the constant repetition of some of these themes um, leaves um, a constituent uh, unsatisfied with um, what direction might be happening and the continual um, reinforcing of that particular could be an injustice or something they disagree with, with a, a government, and it could be a government at, all, at any level. Um, but there is a repetition of that that they can certainly get refueled by, um, by viewing the commentary, the, the comments that um, reinforce that message. And then I think, I mean, one of the critical things here is that there's no way for them to really constructively um, uh, discharge that uh, anger that fuels up in them. Uh, and and I, I think it does begin to accumulate. And we can come back to the social media thing at a later time, but I think that's one of the dimensions that we're um, are at work here. It, it must be uh, tougher and tougher for your former colleagues uh, to deal with political context these days, given these pressures. It, it is, and it's partly because, um, I mean, uh, politics is really about, it, I mean, in its ideal form, is really a two-way exchange where you as a parliamentarian or any elected official, for that matter, is posed with questions, concerns, problems, and in an ideal sense, what you want to be able to do is come back to them, respond, and you have this two-way conversation. And when you can do that, uh, more often than not, you can have you are able to dispel uh, the kind of anger that might be built up with someone. But if you're if you don't have the opportunity to have that conversation, so if it happens in a, you know, an anonymous space and social media, and even I must say, even through electronic communications, messaging, email, Twitter, whatever platform people are using to get back and forth, the, the communication is not as good, not as genuine and authentic to be able to dispel that person's anger uh, to the point where on some particular issues, um, there is just no um, connecting with, uh, with a constituent that has a particular gripe and, and any attempt to try and bring some other you know, reasoned arguments into it, find great objection. So it is getting more difficult. And, and I think it, it's a challenge now to today's public servants to be able to find a way to uh, connect with their constituents in a meaningful way. Okay, well, thank you for that, Bruce. And we will get back to that, certainly. All right, Scott, uh, what is the state of the tribe these days out there? So, I mean, as a sociologist who studies, I do large nationally representative population-based surveys. And then I also do a lot of in-depth interviews. So I can speak to the data on this. I've been collecting data on anger, depression, emotions, large nationally representative. So not anecdotal, but what's really out there in the public. And I can say most people are not angry. Most people are not outraged in the data. It's self-reported, right? So, but self-reported on things. They will report things like feeling less trust. The sense of trust has gone down. Feelings of powerlessness. So this comes up uh, what um, uh, uh, was mentioned earlier about vulnerability and, and uh, powerlessness is a big, big theme. So what's interesting is powerlessness can make people feel depressed because it's kind of like, you know, you, you, you can't control the larger structural forces in your life. And there are big ones. Inequality is a big one. There's a lot of sense of like institutions taking away, taking away freedom or restricting freedom, especially during the pandemic, right? All of a sudden, you know, you couldn't go to the park with your kids anymore. A lot of people, you know, again, not feeling a, a sense of explanation or, um, but I can say in the data, Things like anger, outrage, I'd say fewer than 10% of people say they feel angry most or all of the time. 
Uh, and, and it's a little bit higher if you ask them about lower grade levels of anger, like annoyance. But you can think of annoyance like, boy, it's annoying to try to get across town in Toronto, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, it's a, but that's very different from I'm going to throw something at a politician. We're, we're, we're talking about very different kinds of things. And I do think so. I, I, so from the sociological perspective, I would say, picking maybe up on what Bruce was getting at is, there is, in my view, a sense that the pandemic made feelings of powerlessness more real. All of a sudden, institutions and these figures in the government and the institutions, and I'm from the U.S. originally, so you see this even more. I don't need government to tell me to wash my hands. I know you get people like in the interviews I'm doing, they'll say <laughs> there is this they're not, they're not outraged in the sense that they're going to revolt, but they're, they're angry at larger forces, powerful others, and this is where you get into the politics, because if they didn't elect them and they don't support them, then they have a stronger reaction. But, I mean, I could go on. I think I'll stop there. But my take is, and it's a positive one in a way, I don't think people are necessarily angrier. I do think some of these other forces like trust and powerlessness are things that we have to keep an eye on because I think they're going to fuel. It's interesting. As I said, they don't fuel depression per se, although there is a lot of isolation and classic themes around alienation pop up. I mean, that we've been talking about alienation for, you know, I feel like multiple centuries now. But so, yeah, that's my I think that's my initial take on it. OK, so very different perspectives, all extremely important and the lots to talk about. Um, the panel will know that uh, we solicited questions uh, of our audience like we always do. And I received many questions about how to deal with it and me solutions for mediation, that sort of thing. But it's clear that for some of our audience who received our request for questions, we touched a nerve. And in our description of, uh, of what was going on, there was a reference to furious protesters on the streets of Ottawa. Now, that was not a political statement on the merits or the lack of merits of that particular protest and what was going on there, but rather to indicate how some of the, the behavior seemed to some observers. But uh, there's no question that a couple of our audience members uh, took this as uh, an attack on their, uh, their whole belief structure about what the uh, protest meant. And it went well beyond uh, the context of that, uh, that reference. And in fact, uh, I received two comments. And I'm, I'm just going to tell you what they were. Uh, uh, one was uh, this, the way that was described, this does make me angry. You are fanning the flames of this anger by aping the misinformation uh, in this presentation. And another one is, why the likes of this panel, I'm so sorry, gentlemen, you had nothing to do with this, uh, lying and the media lying about the Ottawa protests. So not only were do we hit the nerve and, and the outrage happened, but we're lumped in with the media who they don't trust and don't like, and we're presumptively going to be lying about it. Now, I am not going to be dealing with the politics of the protest at all. That's not what this is about. This is about behavior. But I found that really interesting uh, as, as a reaction, and because I didn't expect it, quite frankly. Uh, it wasn't, uh, you know, that's not what I saw up there. It was, you are lying. And of course, when somebody insults you, of course, as a human being, you have to talk yourself down from hurt feelings or reaction. Anyway, I'm rambling on, but any comment about that reaction from members of our own community here? Uh, any Anybody for this free-flowing conversation today? I mean, I, I can... Think it, sorry, go ahead, Stuck. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, what you just said, those comments. I mean, first, I, again, I would say, like, there is a lack of trust. Some people really don't trust the institutions. And, you know, I have to be honest about this. I mean... In some cases, conflict sells, right? Conflict sells, and media knows that. I mean, I try to write for broader audiences in the media, and when I put pieces out, 
the ones that have more of an edge and <laughs> they get more clicks. I mean, let's face it, there is, we do have a, an issue with that. It, the problem is when it generalizes and it's diffuse. So like suddenly like everybody in the media is bad. Every politician is corrupt. All academics are left-wing radical, you know? So the other thing that I would say is that anger, look, I mean, political movements, I mean, I'm old enough, like I was out in the streets way back in the 80s with uh, protesting against Ronald Reagan, who wouldn't say the word AIDS for a year. Like, and so there was anger and anger was good because it, it was it was it was in the right amount. We weren't throwing things at Reagan, but we were angry because people were dying and the outrage was justified. And so anger can be used in the right way, in the right moments. It doesn't give you the right to like, so for example, th you know, break into the church and uh, throw, like some people did, like throw red paint all over the place and as a symbol of blood and ruin the church. Like that's too far. That doesn't, that's too far, right? Because then you're, you're having a destructive effect. But so I think like what's interesting about it is it's interesting to, to think that a political movement wouldn't have some anger because usually a political movement is about injustice and trying to correct again it's the right amount in the right time in the right way and i think that's what we've lost sight of and the incivility points that you've talked about is sadly we need kind of leadership to almost model what's the right approach in terms of how we use anger in a real justifiable way so that's i think that would be my reaction to that comment that sense of trust that you talked about is really real okay anybody else want to comment on the hey, Ryan, yeah. I think Playban had a comment, and I'll, I, I've got one day out as well. Go ahead, Playban. Thank you, Playban. Um, I mean, uh, that makes sense, right? Uh, the anger, um, or the angry undertone uh, to that comment that uh, some of the um, observers uh, had made to you, right? And this is not very really different from when uh, couples come to me uh, and one of them has an anger issue, and then when you start talking about their anger, they get more angry, right? Uh, it is not uncommon at all, right? I mean, this is how I understand it, right? Uh, from my world, is that you know, it doesn't matter if you're angry at the spouse or you're angry at the government. It comes down to uh, pay attention to me. Uh, I don't like what you're doing. Restore my pride. Uh, give me justice, and so on. And then it comes to the other part, party too, the aggressor who uses aggression or anger to get your way. And I think Scott brings up a good point: is that like there has to be a better way to deal with this. And uh, there is some way that uh, we need to role model this. And uh, going back to Bruce's point about social media and 120 character, that does not do any justice, right, at resolving this problem. Like every single uh, anger management thing I can think of requires dialogue. And you're not going to have the dialogue on Facebook. You're not going to have it on uh, Twitter. And I think that is also part of the problem. And all, I mean, excellent points. I, I was just going to add, I mean, honestly, we, we've seen this uh, kind of the kind of questions that uh, you, you mentioned, Doug, that we touched a nerve with the, the preamble for uh, tonight's discussion. Uh, and it is similar to the, the kind of um, anger and rage that you see in some comments that will come your way as a as a as a sitting elected representative. Um, and it's it's to a point where you can see that there's emotion in what the writer uh, is saying and uh, the very best thing you can do as as a as a leader at that point and, and a member in your community is get the person on the phone if you can and and have that dialogue because invariably if you can like nine times out of ten um a they will be very pleased first of all that they got the call uh, and second of all, that you can, once you get the emotion out of that discussion, you'll find that you, you can, even if there's disagreement, at least it will be civil, it will be right. And I, Scott's earlier point about the fact that, I mean, yes, we're talking about, you know, what seems to be a growing anger in society. I, I think there's, there's probably good stats that will bear that out, but um, let's not be 
to um, uh, draw too uh, rich a conclusion here, I think far and away, um, the encounter I have certainly in our part of Ontario with constituents and people is generally very good. I mean, even going door to door in, uh, in elections in 2019, 2021, far and away, people are courteous, respectful, um, it, it, but realizing that there are still, you know, perhaps a growing number of people there that we, we need to use some different tools to be able to connect with them. Because, um, uh, you know, Dr. Ishmael's right. I mean, anger serves a good purpose here. It brings great clarity to the message. And it, it, it tells us we took notice of those questions that were toughly worded <laughs> this evening, and it drew our attention to them. And so it has the ability to do that. Uh, but the hope is that it will draw our attention. So we'll take the um, inquiry seriously. We'll do what we can to connect and have that uh, civil uh, conversation to hopefully bring it to some positive um, conclusion at the end. Bruce, I, it may be my age showing, but uh, I, I don't think I'm alone in being concerned about the degree of political polarization that I've seen and certainly in the, in the past decade. Uh, I had occasion to be actually working on the Hill back in the early 90s. And uh, the, the friendships uh, between the members and staff, which I was, uh, with the members of all parties to do the best public policy was, was real. And uh, the tone, and you were deputies, deputy speaker, the tone seems to be so uh, caustic. Um, is that your sense of it? And what would you do about that? It, it can be at times, and, and often the public face of um, politics in our country is that way. It's what you, the clips that you'll see on the news, it's the, the scrums where um, our, our journalists, you know, they, they do a tremendous job in drawing out some of those key questions that they think their audience would like to hear. I mean, you know, a wonderful part of our society that we have this open journalism that, that can make that happen. Yeah. But, you know, the thing is, Doug, those um, strong uh, relationships, um, connections across party lines still happen today. Uh, when members from different parties sit on committees, and you don't see it as often in the public space, but it's still there. Uh, there's a great respect for all members um, because of the work they do. The people in their riding sent them to Ottawa to be their voice for them. And regardless of what party it is, I see these men and women uh, of all ages and from an increasingly uh, uh, much you know, closer to the fabric of our country in terms of diversity. And it, uh, it, it is actually a, a positive thing. Uh, in the end, I, I think we, it gets back to the fact that we, we do have to get ourselves to a point where we can manage this kind of, um, I agree that there are people here who are, are distrustful of government. The, the polarization, some of it uh, is partly because anger and divisions work. You will see parties will will draw lines and, and divisions on issues to actually uh, collate uh, support around a particular position, and but it it means um, messaging in a way that uh, divides people as opposed to, to bringing them together. And this is a tactic uh, that is increasingly used in uh, the political discourse and and has been uh, growing really for the last several decades. Before we, we drill down on what's underlying it and, and then solutions or how we could reach out to the disenfranchised or the people who are, uh, who are having righteous anger or issues to the degree of talking about, I'd like to, to talk about what anger is. And you touched on it, Clayton. Um, I, in my research uh, before today, I reached out to the highest authority. And uh, my wife told me that anger is always about fear. Uh, I'm not going to ask you whether she's right or wrong, but what do you think about that? Is that part of it? We we'll definitely agree to that, right? Um, we ha all have this uh, almond-shaped structure in our brain called the amygdala. And whenever the amygdala receives some kind of input from our environment, uh, it does a quick and dirty job of assessing whether uh, there is a threat. Now, it does not engage the higher functions of our brain, which is the... Uh, prefrontal cortex, which is right behind our forehead right here. Um, amygdala does a quick and dirty work, job of determining if there's a threat and uh, devices a quick reaction to it, which can be your fight or flight reaction. 
Now, if you take a moment to pause when your amygdala is engaged, you will engage your uh, frontal cortex. And that is why we tell people when you're angry, you take deep breaths, you count till 10, because counting till 10 allows you to um, access the higher structure of your brain, which is the reasonable one. It's kind of like um, when you touch something hot, your brain does not have time to think about it. You know, you touch something hot, the reflex action is to move your hand. Same thing, uh, the amygdala receives an input and it determines that whether you should fight or flight, uh, but that is exactly the time when you should take a pause and engage your higher functioning of your brain, the reasoning part of your brain. So definitely fear related. I mean, amygdala is just not um, um, related to the emotion of anger. It's uh, also uh, deals with uh, any kinds of threat that we feel. Okay, thank you. And if anyone wants to comment on that, great. Well, Otherwise, I can, I'm gonna dive into another area. Scott. Well, just to pick up on a few themes there. I mean, so I was looking at some of the comments and you know, one of them was like, and it's something Plavon said about like, mad, people wanna feel like they matter. And, you know, one of the comments was like the government, this is about the government denigrating us. And so, again, I think, I think, I don't think most people feel that way, but I think we have to be mindful of the people who do feel that way. Why, why do they feel like elites are talking down to them or putting them in a cage or restrict, it, it could be completely wrong. They, their perceptions might even seem paranoid at times, but we have to ask the serious question, why do they feel like they're being slighted? Why do they feel like they're being denigrated? Um, why do they feel like they don't matter? Or why do they feel like they're not significant? And in the, in the example of the couples, the couples being angry, I mean, you might even hear some of the same things, like I'm trying to talk to you at dinner and you're looking at your phone. Uh, you, I don't feel like I matter. And I do think it's almost like with the pandemic, I look at those comments and believe me, doing the research that I do, I see a lot of them, but I, I'm very mindful of the conditions that create them. And I don't, I'm not saying that they're accurate, but we, have, we all hold a lot of perceptions that are not accurate. I think we have to drill down and try to understand why. And, you know, and again, I think there are levels and shades of this. There's an extreme element, say, in the U.S., for example, where is it one of the politicians there, you know, is suggesting that somebody like Mitt Romney is a pedophile because he supported the Supreme Court, not the latest Supreme Court nominee. Right. That is just <laughs> it's like so beyond the pale. And it's almost in a different bucket. You see what I'm getting at? It's almost in a very, almost like in a different lane where it's kind of, cons it's off the rails conspiratorial versus people who are angry because they're working 40 hours a week. They can barely make ends meet. And then they see incredible inequality and wealth at the top. So in a way, and then, and then if, they, if you layer into that, they feel like, they're getting a raw deal from politicians who are maybe saying one thing about the pandemic and then privately they're off doing their own thing. And then that comes out in the media, right? Like they're violating the rules that they are imposing. So, I mean, I'm not, again, I'm not justifying any of this, but I do think it's important for us in this moment to model empathy and to model sympathy and to try to diffuse it. Because I worry like if we don't diffuse some of this, it's going to erode, it's gonna cause deeper erosions um, in our institutions. And then the other thing we have to be good at is better at is parsing out when people are being critical. I'm just being critical of the government's policy on taxes. I'm not being hateful, I'm being critical versus being just downright like labeling somebody a pedophile and just being so uncivil that there's no, there's no room for conversation. So I think that's just what I would add to this was a, this part of the conversation. Okay. Well, um, I am jumping around a little bit, but I knew we'd be doing that, gentlemen. Um, uh, one of our uh, listeners uh, said this question, what are some ideas for handling situation with family members who are distrustful of everything and angry? In other words, practically speaking, how do we, uh, how do we avoid a horrible Thanksgiving dinner? <laughs> <laughs> and try to mediate this um, as opposed to everybody being insulted and uh, not talk to each other for 45 years. 
I I think we, it, it, let the sorry. experts uh, weigh yeah. in on that I'm one. I think first. I remember a really funny moment, like uh, growing up, I always knew that, you know, you don't talk politics and religion at uh, dinner table. And then a couple of years ago, there was this um, link or an article that was going around is like, here are 12 talking points uh, that you should make to your family during this Thanksgiving about this particular uh, party doing this, this and this. And I was looking at that going like, this is going to be a disaster. <laughs> Because you're giving people talking points to go and bring it to the dinner table. And then somebody at that dinner table is going to feel slighted or alienated or uh, so on, right? Um, going back um, to your question, though, right? um, and uh, something what Scott said is that uh, there's a huge issue with perception. And that's the thing that we are running into right now, more or less, right? It's... Uh, we have always grown up with uh, ideas about uh, individualism. And now all of a sudden we are being told that, you know, there is something called greater societal good. And a lot of people are having issue reconciling those two values. Uh, because under individualism, your right matters most and everything else is possible. So when you uh, start taking away from that rights, then it gets annoying, right? When you put the rights of others before your own rights and so on. Um, same thing uh, about perception about the world itself is like, you know, uh, and this is the one thing I uh, like to tell my younger uh, clients is that, you know, uh, I know that you have always been told that, you know, the world is going to be, a, world is a fair uh, place and uh, things have to be fair, but uh, bad things do happen to good people. And that is something you need to prepare for. Again, I find that those are conflicting um, perceptions that we don't uh, often make very clear to our younger population. And when they're dealing with this conflict, they often don't deal with it uh, um, rightfully. And then that leads to more anger, resentment, and alienation. So is there anything uh, practically that, that this uh, questioner can do when he's in those situations to could I, make, I could maybe, uh... make it worse? I, I could maybe just offer something on that. I've, I've encountered um, scenarios like that and not necessarily in a family context, uh, but all that can happen too. Um, the, uh, what I have found works um, is, is it really gets back to some of the sort of basic human respect that we pay each other um, when we're listening, um, you know, asking questions and uh, allowing the person to, or persons to, kind of get have their say um, and be, I mean people love to tell their story and so if you can engage them in that way and listen to them and make eye contact and show that you're hearing them out um, I think they they instantly find that they're they're, they're probably their emotional level is going to come down a little bit and uh, you can get to a point where you can have that discussion so if there's a even if it's a respectful disagreement um, it's a constructive way of dealing with something that um, is at its root, creating some anger for that person. Okay. Scott, anything you, you could add to that? I mean, it's a really tough, there's no one size fits all on this one. I think for me over the years, I mean, when I've been in leadership positions and I've had anger at me, I've had to do a lot of work to let go of ego, let go of ego. Don't, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I do feel like this has changed. I feel like people have their positions and they're inflexible now. It's like the, it, this is the way that I think full stop. And I, I agree with what Bruce is saying here. I think that we need to have more space. And I think empathy is the word to keep coming back to here, which is um, I don't need to be right all the time. <laughs> I, 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 we're all wrong most of the time, frankly. And I think like it's easier said than done though. I've had to work on this for years. I was chair of the department for six years and I, boy, I got an eye opening of like, I never, I found myself, I had to take a step back. I never responded in anger. I always, I never, email is a different situation altogether. I never responded to an email in anger. I called the person in, I sat them down uh, and had an open conversation about it. And I found that was really useful. That open, respectful, doesn't always go well. And a lot of things in life don't always go well. That's just the way it is. But I think if we provide a more empathic space for all, for everybody, I think we'll, we'll get closer to that kind of anger, less anger society, not anger free. <laughs> uh, 
What's aggravating? Oh, I'm sorry, Plim. Go ahead. I didn't see. No, I was just going to say that uh, is I really agree with that, Scott. Is like you know we need to move into more of a problem-solving situation rather than a win or lose situation. I think when uh, two parties are angry and having an angry conversation, uh, we get entrenched in our own position because we see that as a fight or flight thing. As a uh, if uh, I don't win, then I lose as opposed to, okay, what is the issue over here and let's problem solve this. I mean, understanding anger goes both ways, right? And it's, uh, you have to understand the cause, but you also have to figure out what to do about it now. And if you have a more problem focused approach, uh, which in my case uh, has always worked, it's like, okay, you are angry and I know I'm not being able to meet your needs right there, but okay, we have a problem now and let's solve this together. I, I think that uh, the, the problem for me sometimes when I'm in that type of situation is the downgrading of information uh, and its sanctity, uh, you know, uh, in terms of uh, things that people believe, fact-based belief, science-based belief. Uh, and during, and, and, uh, during the, the pandemic, um, you know, there were some strong views and they were based on information that wouldn't, wouldn't really pass a doctoral dissertation, I sense, uh, Scott, you know, it, and so in those situations, it's hard to say, well, you know, there's, there's two sides to every story, and yes, the earth might well be flat. I mean, you can't go there because your integrity wouldn't allow it, right? And then you become this pompous person who's probably elitist anyway, and then you've lost, right? So that's my frustration. I, I don't think there's an answer to that, but it's, it's very difficult sometimes uh, because, uh, as our questioners say, truth matters, but truth based on facts that are very, very skeptical yeah. uh, doesn't matter as much in my world anyway. And, and this is where I think to, to a great degree, uh, social media has not been a friend of this because there it, it really is in many ways geared to get eyeballs on screens and keep people there. Uh, and they do it in a way to uh, continue to uh, send, and the algorithms are set up to send content to readers that is purposely provocative, uh, that, that it, it really continues to fuel that anger and, and gets people more and more, so they'll see more and more content that validates that particular position, whatever it may be. Um, and there's no outlet for them to, to constructively sort of uh, dispel that. And it, after numerous repetitions, people can draw some conclusions, uh, perhaps you know, based on information that you know, isn't scientifically tested and so on. But for them, it, it is a reality or a conclusion they've come to. And it's sure not easy, but I, I think to the overall comments here, uh, our, our panel members are absolutely right that, you know, like it or not, the best thing we can do here is find some space to get that back to some kind of constructive exchange. And, uh, and however we do that, I mean, I mean we, we look to our, some of our social scientists and others and humanities that really understand this. And I, I, you know, I think this is where we have to head for sure. Later. Um, I would just like to say that, you know, uh, uh, what you said earlier, Bruce, about like loss of trust and, uh, you know, how people have to do better. I think this whole uh, business of this pandemic has uh, given us plenty of opportunity for um, introspection, right? And I, the trust is also lost in the healthcare uh, system. Right. And I think we should take some ownership of that in, in like, you know, what doctors used to say before you would get on TV or you would uh, send out in a newsletter and say that, OK, this is what you need to do. And people would blindly follow you. And uh, now people are questioning that. So I think there is room for us to also build a trust. And the same thing goes to our uh, science teachers. Right. Is that if you are um, if children are growing up thinking the earth is flat, there is definitely room for us to do better there. So I see that as an opportunity. Um, both uh, for as much as for politicians, but also as much for healthcare workers and science. I mean, we are sitting a, we are currently failing a certain group of people, and we also need to do a better job. And there is a blame to share on both sides. Yeah. I th I think one of the comments you got, uh, Doug, and one of the comments in the feedback, if I'm recalling it correctly, it was somebody who wanted 
They wanted to see something more hopeful and optimistic about Canada. And again, I hear this over and over again, you know, especially with the conversations about racial inequality and reckoning and there's a, lar a large number of people don't understand the complexities there. They think literally like in literally black and white terms and the nuances are gone, right? And I think that I think that also makes people feel alienated. For example, you know, if if a group if one group of a society is feeling more under um, scrutiny now to correct injustices of the past, people aren't necessarily get there. They might feel threatened or vulnerable to bring up the vulnerability theme again. And I, so I think, you know, but again, you can see threads of like, you know, the question was something like, what can I feel proud and hopeful about? So I don't see that as negative and divisive. I see it as somebody who maybe feels a bit under attack, just maybe, maybe again, perceiving it, maybe not really, but perceiving it. And so again, I guess I would just look for like, to answer that question about how to resolve some of the anger, I I almost always think that there's common ground. I agree with you. Like if there are certain people that are gonna say the earth is flat, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know what we can do there. But I do think there's justifiable critical reflection that should be, um, there should be a respectful space to disagree and I don't know how we move back to that. Again, I think it comes back to leadership and the institutions have to play a major role in that. But I do think there's more common, maybe I'm naively optimistic, but I think there's more common ground than we think. But I feel like the, the countervailing forces right now of negativity that Bruce, like Bruce talked about, you know, that whole, like there's, there's, a, there's almost this motive for conflict because it kind of appeals to the crude baseness of us. And I think we just need, maybe once we get out of this pandemic, there'll be a turn back to that more optimism. Well, there seems, uh, I'm not done with social media because it, I think, does a lot of harm. I'm not sure there's anything any government could ever do about that in our free society, but I think it does harm. And it looks to me almost like an anger creation machine and some people are just caught up in its its thrall. Uh, I don't know how you counteract that. We did a show on on uh, social media two years ago, which uh, we didn't drill down as deeply as we we could have. A nice gentleman from Twitter was there, and you know, like. But the fact of the matter is, uh, it's unregulated content, and um, I think it is socially divisive in the execution of it. I say that's more a frustrated statement because, again, I don't think there's anything that can or indeed should be done about it. Maybe I could ask yeah. you that, Bruce. But I think, yeah, I think it, the government has it in its sights, but what do you think? It, it, it's, it's a tough one, and we're not the only jurisdiction that's concerned about it because these are essentially uh, private platforms. Uh, they're run by corporations. Uh, we're watching you know, to see how you know, Elon Musk, I mean, looks at Twitter and whether that deal is going to go through. I mean, to take a, a platform like that and put it in the ownership of, of one entity, um, you know, what are we inviting? But I, I do think there there comes a point when when you consider that uh, they are in the business of selling stuff. I mean, those platforms exist to sell stuff that to customers and they it's all designed to keep people watching those platforms and this is not a criticism of people that use the platforms honestly um, as much as they are can be very much a, a nuisance and a negative element they can they also uh, provide a great means for people to connect so there are some there's a positive side to this story as well um, but the you know it, it is when people find themselves um, getting angry about something they're continuing to see on a social media platform, they might want to, just as a suggestion, think about you know, who in fact um, that uh, continuing fueling of anger is really helping. Uh, and it's often the people who are benefiting from a commercial mm -hmm. advertising point of view, uh, or, or it could be if it's political messaging, it could be that as well. Um, they're, you know, getting adherence to a particular view through stoking that kind of uh, reaction purposely 
uh, amongst viewers. So I do think they're, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm out of politics now. I'm not a policymaker, but I, I do think there will come a time where these, uh, as we have done in other uh, spheres of, of, of the private sector, um, where for the purposes of public safety and, you know, social cohesion, call it what you will, um, there does have to be uh, some form of regulation of these, of how these uh, systems work, um, because they, 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 it should not be turned loose as a menace on society that's uh, the creating this problem and all to uh, someone else's uh, benefit. Well, isn't it fair to say that the human condition is such that somebody will find a way to manipulate or exploit anything to a certain end, uh, and that's human behavior, but that's just something we have to be aware of. Uh, Playman, I'm sorry, you were wanting to jump in there. I think social media is going in a uh, quite dangerous direction. Uh, and I say this as a consumer of uh, social media. This whole business of uh, blocking anyone that disagrees with you eventually creates a silo and an echo chamber. So if I start blocking everybody that thinks the earth is round, I'm very soon going to be a, in a group of people, connected with a group of people that feels that the earth is flat and we are going to constantly reinforce each other. The other problem is also when uh, Twitter went on this huge, but I'm just talking about Twitter because that's uh, the social media platform I use, is that you know they went on this banning all these people, right? Uh, and uh, again, I'm not going to debate about whether that was the right direction or not, but what they did is that they went on an underground platform. And now you have no clue of what's going on there. So again, it went from like mainstream to underground and then just get worse from there, right? So those are my fears. If I could just add, I mean, that, that you know, uh, Playbun is right, that brings up another issue, and that is that some of these platforms purposely decide what they're going to allow on their platform or not. So if you if they if they, if they become the moderators of what they're going to put out there, this also fuels anger in a particular audience that now no longer or is excluded from seeing what could be a legitimate point of view. Um, but they, they keep it out of off their mix because perhaps they want to skew. Again, I'm sounds, I'm almost sounding conspiratorial here and I don't mean to be, but it, it's when you, when you put that control in the hands of, you know, a small unelected group that has no accountability back to society in any form, um, the, it, you, you potentially set up a, a risk here that is something that I, I think policymakers uh, in the future are going to have to deal with. I think just quickly to add to that. Go ahead. Oh, just, yeah. to quickly, just to quickly add to that. I mean, my sense is that as, as, as institutions that used to allow us to get a sense of community or bonding as those have eroded include you know religion or community kinds of associations as those erode and we become more isolated something has to replace that something i mean i'm actually surprised at how i ask people about their time and what they do <laughs> speaking of retirement like people don't it's shocking how little people have to do that's meaningful to fill up time. And social media is just so easy and it can provide, I mean, it's, it is a, it is a dangerous place because it can provide a space again, even if it's a fringe, it can be quite volatile. And the, the other side of that though, is I agree, like I, I think the more we restrict free speech or the, you know, the sort of the mob culture or the cancel culture or whatever you want to call it, all of that's dangerous too in different ways, right? Because it's, it's again, we need to have an empathic critical space for critical reflection that doesn't necessarily um, involve denigrating each other. I mean, I've thought about this a lot. Like I see ads the government puts out for like anti-vaping, for example, or, and I'm always thinking like, what about a national campaign to rebuild social bond? I don't know, maybe it sounds corny or hokey, but like, What's doing more damage, vaping or like extreme social isolation and fragmentation and divisiveness? You know, I mean, maybe that sounds corny, but I think maybe we should have a serious conversation about revisiting social bonds and how to rebuild them. And it's the only way we're going to counter the divisiveness of social media because it's not going to go away. 
And, and that, that's the message of hope, I think, in this, and to, to circle back to our questioner, I mean, that's ultimately the, the challenge that we have is we got to go out now and, and, and find ways to, to make that space happen for people. Because if we don't, that it's just going to continue to stoke a, a higher level of anger, I think. And, you know, we, we have to take it upon ourselves as a community to, to make that happen. Well, I, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, the expression, we're all in this together, had currency. I don't hear it quite as much at this stage when people are tired and a bit cranky. But, I mean, isn't it at the end of the day, uh, the message has to be from everybody and all institutions that if we're in a society, we got to find ways to live together. Right? I mean, Canada itself is a reflection on that, you know, a, a joining of differences. It, it shouldn't have worked, <laughs> but it worked because of some canny uh, politicians ahead of their time who put it together. So um, that's what I think is, is the message I'm hearing from all of you. We have to uh, be positive and not form tribes and not insult one another and try to listen to people who don't feel listened to. That's what I'm that's hearing. It. I mean, Polit politics has always been adversarial, right? I mean, I think by its nature, politics is adversarial, but it doesn't have to be uncivil. I think that's where we, you know, politicians like used to duel each other back in the day. I mean, um, but I do think like, I think, I think there needs to be a broader conversation about like, it's okay for values to differ, but how do we find common ground in that space? while at the same time recognizing that politics is going to be rough and tumble and adversarial. And so I don't know. I don't know. I'm not a politician, but that's the space that I would be looking to get into, I think. Yeah. All right. I'll add two things, um, if that's okay, okay uh, Doug. Is, uh, okay. you know, um, Scott, you said earlier about empathy, right? And I think that's the key here, right? In term empathy and kindness to each other. And I think that will go a long way in uh, dissolving uh, these issues, this polarization, and uh, this uh, untamed anger uh, that uh, is happening in our society. Uh, Bruce, you said earlier about like how um, um, when politicians uh, take a jab at each other, uh, that makes news. But when they're kind to each other, it does not make news. And I'm sure there are plenty of moments. And I think their media has a role to showcase that example uh, to everyone. It's like, well, this is what happens as well, right? Yeah, they do on occasion. There's the odd sort of glimmer of hope on that, but it's uh, the ratings for some reason are not as high on shows like that. Well, um, what a great note to end our discussion, gentlemen. Uh, the word empathy. Uh, I mean, that's the takeaway. Uh, what a human thing to say. So thank you, and thank you all. And unfortunately, and as I warned you, the time just blitzes right by, and it's always much too soon that I have to wrap this up. But... I have to, but this has been fascinating for me and I'm sure our audience. So uh, I want to uh, give my sincere thanks to our distinguished panel for their insights today and their time. Uh, Dr. Playman Ishmael, Bruce Stanton and Scott Sheeman, thank you so much and thank you for your service to our community, every one of you. Um, this program marks the last in our Straight Talks public affairs series after three seasons. Uh, we've enjoyed putting these shows on and they were possible because of a number of volunteers and staff. Uh, I want to thank, before we conclude, uh, the staff at the Midland Cultural Center, including in particular Michelle Thibodeau, and before her, Jara Jaila, and our Rogers production team, and in particular, my sincere thanks to our hardworking producer, Ron Clark, who always gave me the best feedback on these topics. And I also want to sincerely thank our Straight Talk Steering Committee for their support, hard work, and encouragement over the last three years, including Fred Hacker, Allison Dirtnell, and Burke Penny. Above all, these programs would not have been possible without the dedication and uh, efforts on the part of our amazing director of research, my dear friend, Gord McKay. So it has been an absolute pleasure to work with them and some very interesting panels over the last three years. And on behalf of the MCC and all of us at Straight Talk, thank you for watching. Enjoy your summer and stay safe out there. Thank you.